Well, welcome to our webinar entitled The Voice of Families, Pathways to Integrated Employment for Individuals with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, my name is Eric Carter. I'm joined by Laura Berry and Emily Lanchek, and we are excited to present an overview of our project and a snapshot of some of the early findings that we hope give voice to families who are eager to see their daughters and sons flourish in the workplace. Our agenda for this webinar is uh, relatively brief. We want to give you an overview of our five-year project, talk about the study methodology that we'll be using uh, in our first phase, which is a qualitative study, as well as later on in our randomized controlled trial, and give you a snapshot of some of the early findings from that qualitative study. And we'll conclude with uh, some overview of where we're going next in this project. But before we get too far, I did want to acknowledge uh, just how grateful we are to be part of this larger RRTC under the leadership of Virginia Commonwealth University and to introduce you to some of our other team members who contributed substantively to the design of this project. So in addition to myself and Emily and Laura, our team also includes Elise McMillan, Julie Lowndes Taylor and Laura Fleming from the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. So let me turn it over to Emily who will give you an overview of why this work matters so much before we get into uh, the specifics of our study. Great, thank you. Um, in these next few slides, I'm going to give you an overview of the goals and scope of our five-year project, as well as introduce our recent study on the parent perspectives on pathways to integrated employment. But first, I'd like to share a little bit more about the benefits of employment for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and the impactful role of the family. So like anyone else, youth and adults with disabilities want to participate fully in the life of their community. Although there are many different avenues for community inclusion, finding a good job may be among the most impactful. A satisfying job provides opportunities to develop new friendships, share talents, meet the needs of others, and learn new skills. A regular paycheck provides resources for meeting personal needs, makes involvement in community activities possible, and fosters independence. A good job can make a powerful difference in the lives of individuals with IDD. We'll now watch a short video that captures some of the dreams and aspirations of young adults with disabilities. Rebecca? Is it Rebecca or Rebecca? Rebecca. Uh, what do you want to be with your job? I want to be a, um, that's a hard one. Um, a farmer. Um, I kind of want to work with animals. Alright, you're going to look at me and okay? Okay. What do you, what kind of job do you have? I want to do a shot wire. I would like to be a tour guide when I grow up at a museum. I want to work at FedEx. I want to work at Publix and Fieldston Farms. I like to be an landscaper. I to I want to be a special education teacher. Uh, is that even recorded yet? Yeah, it's recording. Oh, God. <laughs> it's all right. But it's like it's not here. Just look at me, okay? <laughs> we need to reshoot that then. Yeah, I love that video. Um, so we've all heard the saying, great help is hard to find. As employers struggle to find dependable, motivated candidates, many overlook a pool of desirable applicants. Individuals with IDD make up an underutilized population of potential employees. As we saw in the video, these young people are excited to find employment and have dreams to join a variety of career fields. Descriptors of employees with IDD include dependable, engaged, motivated, great attendance, attention to work quality, and high productivity. These qualities not only improve workplace outcomes, they positively influence community attitudes and actions. Customers have reported that they prefer to do business with companies that employ people with disabilities. These benefits indicate exciting possibilities and outcomes related to employment. 
But unfortunately, too many individuals with disabilities lack the encouragement, opportunities, and supports needed to find a great job doing something they enjoy. The employment outcome outlook across the country remains as concerning as ever. Across the United States, less than one-fifth of adults with IDD hold jobs in their local community. Here in Tennessee, only 17% of working age adults with IDD are employed. These outcomes certainly do not reflect the aspirations of individuals with disabilities as shown in the previous video and seen in the figure in red, which reflects the percentage of high school students with ID nationally who expect to have a paid job in early adulthood. Youth and adults with disabilities are quite clear about their desire to share their gifts and talents in the workplace. Despite these aspirations and long-standing calls to elevate employment outcomes, integrated employment has still not been adopted in widespread ways. In this figure, the orange reflects the total number of adults with IDD served by state systems. The blue is the percentage of adults that are served in integrated employment nationally. Employment outcomes have not improved over the years, yet the number of adults served has increased. What will it take to change the employment landscape across the country? While multiple factors influence employment outcomes, the contribution of parents and supporting family members are among the most powerful. The majority of adults with IDD reside with their parents and only 25% access long-term services, making parents among the most prominent sources of support and guidance. Research finds that the expectations of parents positively influence employment outcomes. It was found that young adults with significant disabilities whose parents expected them to obtain post-school employment um, were five times as likely to have paid employment within two years after exiting school. The influence of parents and families is clear, yet many struggle to envision employment to know how to pursue it or to assemble the supports their son or daughter needs. We are drawing on the experiences of families who have successfully navigated the path to integrated employment to design supports that will guide other families through this process. The study we'll be speaking about today is part of the first phase of our five-year research project focused on improving employment outcomes. We will develop, pilot, refine, and evaluate an intervention package that combines both information sharing and parent mentorship. Later on in this presentation, Laura is going to walk you through more details on that intervention package. Okay, before developing the resource package, in the first phase of this project, we wanted to speak directly with the intended users, so parents and family members of working age adults with IDD. Inviting their perspectives and listening to their recommendations ensures we develop an intervention that is feasible and accessible. In the next phase, we'll finish developing materials and pilot our intervention with a small group of families. Then we'll refine these materials and evaluate the intervention within a rigorous study with at least 80 families. And in the final phase, we'll package materials for statewide and national dissemination. The purpose of the qualitative study from phase one is to examine the perspectives and recommendations of families regarding the employment of their family member with IDD. We are exploring three primary research questions, which are shown on the screen. How do parents and siblings define and prioritize meaningful employment for their family member? What barriers to integrated employment do they identify? What do they say is needed to facilitate integrated employment? And we also asked families questions related to our resource development. We were committed to hearing from families across Tennessee. We partnered with our project's advisory committee and over 50 different organizations to recruit a, diver a diverse group of participants. 
um, partnering organization helped us recruit through email, social media, newsletters, website posts, and phone calls. To be included, individuals must have a working age family member, which could be a son, a daughter, a sibling, a grandchild, with an intellectual disability, autism, or multiple disabilities, and live in Tennessee. We interviewed 60 family members of individuals with IDD from across 17 counties within Tennessee. Most were parents with a majority, about 64% being mothers and 17% fathers. The age of participants ranged from 24 to 81 with an average age of 56 and one third of participants were non-white. Their family members experienced a range of disabilities with the highest prevalence being intellectual disability and or autism spectrum disorders. Most, about 63% were male and 37% female with an age range between 16 and 60 and the average age was 27. Uh, almost half were working in the community at the time of our interviews and those jobs include custodial positions, food preparation, retail, entertainment, child care. So a really great variety. We used a combination of individual interviews and focus groups to solicit the views and recommendations of participants. These conversations were typically 60 to 90 minutes. Um, we held a majority of our focus groups in person and then with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to continue over Zoom and we held about 65% of our interviews and about a third of our focus groups through video conferencing. We developed a semi-structured interview protocol that addressed all three research questions and invited participants um, to share feedback on the initial version of our proposed intervention. After completing interviews, we reviewed each transcript to identify segments speaking to our research questions, which are shown on the screen. And we used a team-based coding approach to compare codes, discuss emerging themes, and reach consensus. We have been using the deduce software to further analyze themes, um, which we will now present to you in the next uh, batch of slides. So Dr. Carter will start off with sharing an overview of our findings. Well, thanks, Emily. So uh, as you'll recall, we had three primary research questions that we were focusing on in this first qualitative phase. And the first of those questions uh, was, how do parents define and prioritize employment for their family members with intellectual and developmental disabilities? And we had a number of our uh, interview questions that actually spoke to this particular topic. Uh, we asked about the extent to which they considered employment to be an important goal for their family member and why or why not. Uh, we asked them exactly, uh, you know, what would meaningful employment look like for him or her and how likely would that be to happen. So on the next slide, you'll see an overview of some of the answers that we heard. When we uh, asked about why is work so important, we heard things like it provides purpose and meaning. It instills a, a sense of pride and self-worth. It promotes community involvement. It furthers independence. It enables other life goals. It makes people feel like anyone else. Uh, it reflects something they love to do. It builds their confidence and self-esteem. It contributes to it, social connections and financial stability. It's engaging, it challenges them. It contributes to a meaningful life. It brings dignity, it sparks joy. It teaches life skills provides learning opportunities. It allows them to meet the needs of others in their community. It contributes to their overall well-being. It provides a, a place of belonging. It gets them out of the house and it introduces them to valued roles. So a wide range of, of uh, features of work that makes it matter from the perspectives of these family members. And I hope you'll just notice first the wide range of reasons that are arrayed on your screen and that it varies from family to family and individual to individual. And second, I hope you'll notice how much these motivations resemble the very same reasons that work matters for anyone at all. Well, in addition to looking at why work uh, matters, we also looked at what features of a job might matter most. And again, this is from the perspective of family members, largely parents, who are saying these are the important features of a job for my son or daughter. They talked about having a sufficient number of hours, a job that provides a living wage, 
a job that's a really strong match with their son or daughter's interests, one that provides opportunities for career growth. They also emphasize the importance of an environment that's safe, that's inclusive, that provides opportunities for social relationship and really fosters a sense of community. They emphasize the importance of having adequate support on the job, but also that their son or daughter would have work that they themselves considered meaningful. And they talked about things like working alongside like-minded coworkers, having responsibilities that match their abilities, but that were appropriately challenging, and jobs that were predictable and involved working along coworkers who were kind and patient uh, and enjoyable. So again, not all jobs are the same, and there's lots of diversity here into what parents were looking for and the kinds of jobs that would matter to them. And you can really see here that a good fit for a job, of course, is always determined one person at a time. And so no two people really gave the same combination of features that would matter to them. So what are some takeaways from this first research question? Well, you'll see uh, as these appear, uh, the views of these family members did vary widely in response to the, those questions. There was no one perspective among family members on why work matters or what makes a job most meaningful. We also heard that a steady paycheck is absolutely important, but there's more than just the paycheck that matters. And in fact, families talked about other less tangible, but really no less important benefits all throughout these uh, conversations. It was about a paycheck, but there was much else that also mattered. And we also learned that many of the participants, uh, they themselves said they actually held somewhat different definitions of meaningful employment for themselves than they did for their family member with IDD as well. So we see a number of implications for practice here. I think the impact of employment definitely extends well beyond the income a job provides, just like it does for anyone. And so supporting individuals with IDD to, to really obtain a good job uh, also introduces them to a host of other benefits that can enrich their lives. We also know that researchers should examine the quality of employment experiences, not just employment rates. Right? The various job features that families said represent um, important elements of their job for their son or daughter, those are all potential areas of measurement in our future studies. Uh, what is job satisfaction? What's the degree of inclusivity? What's the nature of the social relationships that people have at their work site? And finally, although parents and siblings had valuable insights on this issue, we want to just emphasize that we recognize we also need to hear from individuals with IDD. Their voices are also critical here. And so additional studies really need to look at the ways in which the views of sons and daughters diverge from or converge with those of their family members. So that was the first question that we looked at. The second research question was a little bit different. We asked what barriers to integrated employment do parents identify for their family members with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And here too, we had a series of questions within our interview protocol that really targeted this topic. We asked about what makes it hard for their family member to find or keep integrated employment. We asked about the barriers they consider to be most challenging and whether any of those barriers they identified would end up being kind of almost deal breakers in their perspective in the pursuit of employment. So on the next slide, you'll see a uh, Oh, the ways that we've categorized these barriers through our qualitative uh, analysis. There was a number of different ones that emerged within interviews, as well as across different family members. But most of the barriers fell within these six key areas that you see on your screen. Individual factors, family factors, school factors, disability service system factors, workplace factors, and community factors. And as you see them on your screen, I'm going to talk about them uh, in these in this order. But this did wasn't necessarily the order in which they were, um, or I should say, the order doesn't necessarily reflect the importance or impact. In fact, it's probably the collective impact of these barriers uh, that that together. Uh, uh, prevents uh, so many young people with disabilities from uh, sharing their gifts and talents in the workplace. So let me walk through each of these and I'll start with individual factors. These were barriers that were really described by families as emerging from either the abilities of their sons and daughters, for example, difficulties related to communication, their sort of cognitive or physical or sensory or endurance capacities or it might relate to the skills that their sons and daughters or family members have, maybe limitations in the areas of social or personal care or self-management, or even 
job uh, search or self-advocacy skills. Uh, some families mentioned behavioral challenges and safety concerns that were factors that inhibited employment. And other families just talked about the perspectives of their sons and daughters, their motivations to work, their understanding of the concept of employment, or even their self-confidence in the workplace. I want to emphasize that uh, while families may have mentioned the, these as being the sources of barriers, they may not actually be the actual source, right? It could be about a mismatch with the environment or the lack of supports in the environment that makes these issues a, a, a more or less of a challenge. But let me just share a quote from one of the mothers of a 22-year-old son with autism who said, you know, my son has a more narrow view based on what he feels that he can do. And I'll say that again, being on the spectrum, particularly the actual skill of doing the job is never going to be the problem. It's navigating all the hidden agendas and the water cooler talk and the subtle cues of interacting with a boss that he might not quite understand. So individual factors were one set of barriers, but so were family factors. And so families talked about barriers related to the capacity or the commitment of families to pursue and support integrated employment. Most of those examples focused on the perspectives that families have, whether that might be low expectations related to employment or just a sense of hopelessness or fatigue in this area. Some of those factors related to what parents knew about the resources and strategies that are available to support employment or didn't know in many cases. Some of the uh, barriers related to the connections of families to resources that they might need. The absence of a support team that could help their son or daughter with disabilities. Or just the challenges of trying to navigate issues related to benefits and the impact of working on those benefits. And some of the conversations focused on the priorities of parents. Just whether or not this pursuit of work was a priority amidst all the other issues and challenges they were facing at the time. Uh, here's a sibling of a 58-year-old female with an intellectual disability who said, so I guess my point is, and I, I could be very wrong, but it's hard for me to imagine that she could be in the workplace where, with, where someone other than me, which I'm exhausted, someone other than her primary advocate, which is me, would be fighting as hard for her to be all she could possibly be in the work environment. In addition to family factors, uh, for those parents and siblings who were, had family members who were school age, school factors were also prominent. They talked about barriers related to the instruction and the services and supports that were offered all throughout elementary, secondary, and even post-secondary schools. Examples included expectations and preparation of educators, uh, the availability of adequate instruction, the quality of communication between schools and families, or even just the absence of individualized services. As one mother of a transition age youth with autism said, there was no curriculum, right? They were sitting there putting together parts which wasn't meaningful. And I think it really starts with the school needing to raise their expectations. And they also need to let vocational rehabilitation understand that everybody's not going to put together parts. Everybody's not going to hang clothes. Everybody's an individual. In addition to the school factors, the disability service system was a prominent part of these conversations. Uh, these barriers focused on the services and supports that were available through state or federally funded agencies and programs. And the concerns here surrounded the, the knowledge of that service system or the ability to access those services or even the implementation of those services, the degree to which they were delivered with quality. Uh, and even we heard elements of, of barriers related to the attitudes of staff and the quality of those collaborations. And you know, you heard this in the, the quote from a mother of one 20 year old son, 21 year old son with autism who said, you know, I'm a, I'm a mama bear. And so a lot of what I've learned, it's trial and error, it's hunting and pecking, it's emailing, and I've spent unbelievable amount of hours and I still don't have the answers. So many families said they just don't understand this complicated service system. Well, other issues that arose focused on the workplace. And there were barriers focused on the practices and perspectives and support of local employers. Issues here surrounded their willingness or preparedness or flexibility or expectations of employers. Family members talked about the attitudes of coworkers and customers or the adequacy of on the job supports. And all throughout this was a sense of whether there's really an overall match between my son or daughter and the particular workplace. Um, you saw this in the quote from a sibling of a 24 year old male with autism who said, you know, since he's pretty high functioning, a lot of times people just assume that his discrepancies are having a bad attitude or him being lazy. 
But there was a lot of times where he wouldn't understand instructions properly and they get mad at him or threaten him and he'd come home crying and stuff. I think just a place that not only checked it off the box of this employee has special needs, but that they really understand what that means and how to come up, uh, how to come with that, how to set them up for success. Those were the things that might be important in a place of employment. And the final area, final area that we heard emphasized in these discussions about barriers focused on community factors. These were things that extended beyond any given person or given school or given workplace and were really more broader uh, reflections on the opportunities and supports and attitudes that were prevalent in a local community. And the barriers weren't surprising here. Concerns about the availability of transportation or even the availability about job openings for anyone in their rural community or in their community at the time of the pandemic or even just the overall views and attitudes of community members and how they might perceive the employment of people with disabilities. And that was reflected in the quote from a mother of a 27 year old with a uh, son with autism who said, well, the biggest number one barrier that we've had is people not understanding autism or IDD period and trying to limit them. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, well, he could push carts at Kroger, which is a local grocery store, as if that's all these kids can do. And that's wrong. And that's a misconception. So that's a snapshot of some of those barriers and some of the takeaways that we think are important uh, are as follows. You know, participants readily identified a whole collection of barriers that they felt made employment more complex or daunting to pursue. They did not have trouble naming barriers. And those barriers didn't just come from one place, they came from multiple sources, not just a single person or program, but it was really that collection and combination of barriers that stood in the way. And while many barriers uh, received lots of sort of amens and affirmations across the interviews, we did find that each parent sort of raised their own unique combination of barriers that were really aligned to their son or daughter and their own context. The barriers in rural communities might differ than urban communities, those for students who had more complex support needs than those who had less complex. And while each of the barriers that we heard did have a solution, again, it's that combination of barriers that makes this pursuit of employment so challenging. And that was the final point that we heard. So a few implications for practice. Parents do have firsthand experiences that provide very valuable insights into sometimes the subtle barriers and sometimes the substantial barriers that exist in their community. And so it's worth asking families about the barriers they're encountering. We also think that improving employment outcomes within a particular community is going to really require working together to address this multiple collection of barriers, ones that occur across home, school, work, agency, and community context. And last, you know, I think these barriers that were raised by families, they reflect really long-standing concerns within the field. We have heard these over and over in the literature, and it's a reminder that we just have to work harder and swifter to remove these barriers right now. So with those uh, two first research questions in mind, let me turn it back to Laura, who will talk about our third research question. Great, thank you, Eric. All right, so our final research question was around what do they say is needed to facilitate access to integrated employment for family members with intellectual and developmental disabilities? And so for this research question, we asked questions around, you know, what do you think would have to be in place to support your family member to access integrated employment and why? And what sorts of support or help do you think your family member would need to be successful in a paid job? And which of these are the most important? So when we were assessing this research question, um, we found that parents and family members were very creative and thought outside of the box in terms of what facilitators there were to employment. So the 10 key areas that showed up were these that are listed on the screen. So it was things like expectations, attitudes, awareness or knowledge, planning, experiences, instruction, connections, supports, environments, communication, and then other. And we're going to go through each of these key areas and explain them a little bit more um, and share some takeaways from the family members that we heard from. First of all is expectations. 
A lot of the family members emphasize the importance of raising expectations among their sons or daughters, their family members, employers, educators, service providers, and all different stakeholders, so that each can envision employment and will pursue it vigorously. They also talked about attitudes and cultivating mindsets that were marked by flexibility and an openness to new ways of doing things, as well as the need to address the attitudes of coworkers and service providers that their son or daughters may already be working with. So here's a dad of a 22 year old son with autism. And he said, he tries to be independent. He wants to be independent. He enjoys it. He loves his job. He's very happy as he comes out of his job and tells me about what he did during the day. It impacts him positively. He enjoys working. He makes sure he does a good job and he's proud of it. Another key area was awareness or knowledge. In this um, area, we noticed a lot of family members sharing that they advocated for informing families, employers, and communities about the benefits of hiring individuals with disabilities and making sure that awareness was out there alongside promoting existing employment resources and programs. Also planning. Family members proposed better planning processes that were individualized and outlined a pathway to integrated employment. So not always one size fits all, but working with each family. One mother of a 25 year old son with autism said, so as an advocate, I tell anyone I come into contact as soon as they're 14 to start calling VR, but people don't really know that. Another key area that was a facilitator to employment was experience. Family members encouraged increased involvement in early work experiences while still in high school, as well as career development experiences like internships or volunteering that could help individuals discover their career goals and gain important skills and dispositions. They also mentioned instruction as a key area for helping their sons or daughters with employment. And this was identified by an array of skills that should be addressed through well-planned instruction in the areas of communication, self-advocacy, self-management, social skills, driving, employment, independent living, and more. So one mother of a 23-year-old son with an intellectual disability shared, so it doesn't matter what your learning capacity is to a point as long as you can find something that you really enjoy and people are willing to support you to learn. It's all about this on the job training for these kids. A couple more areas that they mentioned were connections and supports. So for connections, family members were sharing about creative and intentional efforts to capitalize on their son and daughter's personal networks, strengthen the employer outreach was large, was huge, and assisting individuals with IDD in their job search. For supports, they discussed the power of personalized supports on the job, working on adaptations, accommodations, job coaching, and working with their coworkers as their natural supports. And for families, working on advocacy and benefits counseling, and also, it often came up that they wanted to address transportation supports. One father of a 25-year-old daughter with an intellectual disability said, they had, we call it the blank manual, a manual on what she needed. We had a lot of conversations about her personality, how to handle situations. It's just like everybody knew, hey, this is the book of how to help. And this is what you need to be aware of. She doesn't like conflict. And the last two areas that we um, came across for facilitators were environments and communication. For environments, family members explained the importance of connecting their son and daughters to workplaces that reflected a strong match in the areas of interests, responsibilities, schedules, supports, and inclusivity, making sure it matched a, around a whole array of items. They also discussed communication and 
conveyed the need for open communication among families and employers, effective approaches for disability disclosure, and ideas for sharing the strengths of applicants with IDD more effectively, really focusing on the strengths. One mother of a 27-year-old son with autism said here, he's willing to learn, and because his boss is willing to pull him aside and say, hey, we got to work on this, this is not good, or you're getting behind here. Because of the positive way his boss works with him, my son has just continued to excel and to grow and to learn. He's never had a job like this where they just, they get him, they encourage him, and they also correct him. So our selected findings and implications from this research question on what facilitates employment is that overall participants were optimistic about the possibility of integrated employment for their family members and identified very practical steps toward this goal. Although many of the individual suggestions offered by participants may sound simple, the overall solution to this persistent challenge is really quite complex. And promoting integrated employment will require the collective investment of individuals, families, schools, agencies, employers, and communities. The recommendations of participants were not confined to a single stakeholder. It's going to take everyone getting involved. The perspectives people hold directly influence the practice and policies they pursue. We found that the expectations, attitudes, and awareness people have likely influence the actions that they did or did not take. So implications from these findings are that parents, siblings, and other relatives really have creative insights into the strategies and supports that can promote employment for their family members with IDD. Educators, providers, and other professionals should seek out their perspectives in this area, both in informal situations and meetings to develop really individualized education plans and plans for employment and making sure that they are person-centered. Also, interventions aimed at increasing employment outcomes should be multifaceted. We can't focus on one thing, and we need to incorporate the strategies suggested across all of these 10 areas. Local communities should consider how they could work in concert to better integrate services and supports so that individuals with IDD have the very best chance of participating in the workforce. So that is a summation of our research findings. And if any of these intrigue you or interest you and you'd like to learn more, we have several briefs that talk about our insights in full and give a lot more details. These are all available and we would be glad to share drafts of them as we are working on them over the next few months, but these are also available. And so in the details, I'm sure we will share how you can get um, each of these project briefs to learn more. So our next steps is that we are currently in phase two, where we are developing materials um, so that we can help um, with piloting with at least five families. And we'll discuss those materials on the next slide, what we are working on, and we're finalizing our measures. We'll still have phase three and four, but we're currently in the phase two, um, which will be happening over the next year. The materials that we are creating in phase two, um, it's our initial intervention package, and there's two main parts of this package. One is development of an employment roadmap. And this is basically a practical guide to pursuing integrated employment. It will be multifaceted, including all 10 areas that the parents mentioned and facilitators and also addressing their barriers um, in, that we've discussed in the research questions. It will basically be a guide that their mentor will be able to walk them through to help them find employment using best practices from everything from human resources to um, what fellow parents have been through to what other I people with IDD recommend. Ongoing mentor, the connection to a fellow navigator is the second piece of our intervention package. And this is an ongoing mentoring and support from another parent whose daughter or son is already working. 
So each parent that is a part of this program will be matched with a parent who's already been through the employment process with their son or daughter. And that mentor will be trained in the employment roadmap and be able to walk them through and be a guide. Um, because we have found overwhelmingly in the research so far that the human connection is key and that parents can really learn from the success that other parents have had. And they trust those who've already been through it and who have a similar um, life experience. All right. And Eric, would you like to close us out? Sure. Well, I hope the uh, overview that we've provided of, of the initial phase of the project, but also this description of where we're going next and trying to take what we've learned from families and package it into a practical and impactful intervention, uh, that that intrigues you and you might want to learn more along the way. Uh, so we wanted to make sure you knew about the website for the overall RRTC. And within that, you'll see information about our particular study, which is study five. Uh, we hope to be posting our uh, research briefs there, as well as uh, future information about each of the different phases as they develop. And we hope that this information will help equip you in your own work to uh, help uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to discern uh, what kinds of contributions they'd like to make in workplace, and then to find the supports uh, and encouragement they need uh, to bring uh, those aspirations to reality within a local workplace. So thank you for your work on behalf of people with disabilities. And we look forward to hearing any questions that you might have or following up with any information that you request. So thank you.